Everything you're about to see in this video is performed by a professional idiot, and I would not recommend trying this at home. Hey, what's up guys? Welcome to another video, a tech video, and the tech videos you all seem to like on this channel are either me talking about Apple's newest hardware with the Apple Silicon chips, or me trying to use older Mac computers in the modern day. And I like a challenge, don't get me wrong, but this was one of those challenges where I think I took it a bit too far. So me being me, I wanted to try the extreme version of using an old Mac in 2022. And after I did the 2008 MacBook in 2021 and in 2020, because that video took forever to make, I figured, eh, I have a 2006 MacBook Pro, but that's not really that much of a difference. And I have a Power Mac G5, which maybe I'll do later, but I want to do a laptop. And so the only other laptop I had in the lineup that was currently functioning was a 2000 PowerBook G3 clamshell. This guy here, this big, beautiful monster. This is easily one of my favorite laptops. I would say my favorite laptop design out of Apple. And so I figured, well, I have the SE, which was the fastest model that they offered. Is it usable in 2022? And I'm not going to pull a BuzzFeed and say the answer will surprise you. because It won't. But there were a few things that I tried that did actually surprise me. So we're going to talk about that today. Now, before we get into how it is to use in 2022, let me tell you guys about the specs, because I did say that this is the most powerful version you can get. The only thing this was not optioned with was the larger 30 gig hard drive. 30 gigs. Uh, it's got 10 gigs in it, still a hard drive, still the original hard drive, which considering this thing came out in 2000 is pretty impressive. But the SE was the model of this iBook that was sort of the one to get. And the graphite one was sort of the first of Apple making a more subtle color as opposed to having them be really flashy like the orange, the blue, or the key lime. So for specifications on this iBook G3 clamshell from the year 2000, first things first, we have a PowerPC G3 processor clocked at 466 megahertz, the fastest that was ever available in this particular model of the iBook. Interestingly enough, it's not fan cooled, and this is actually the same processor that they were using in the iMac because this was meant to be the iMac on the go. So kind of an interesting little fact there because the iMac had a fan with the same clock speed and this didn't. Next up we have RAM, kind of an interesting configuration because you have 64 megabytes soldered to the board, which was the most that you could get optioned to be soldered onto the board. But then you also have 512 megabytes of RAM in a separate SODIMM slot, making for a very odd 576 megabytes of RAM. Yeah, we're living large today with RAM because you know you need that for web browsing. In terms of storage, we have the 10 gigabyte hard drive option, which is the main option. You could have gotten it optioned with 30 whole gigabytes. I don't know what you would have done with all that space, but this one has the much more reasonable and more cost effective 10 gigabytes of storage, which I almost completely filled with music. Aside from that, everything that I did was done on this beautiful 800 by 600 12.1 inch TFT display and was typed on this actually surprisingly decent keyboard and navigated with this definitely worn trackpad. <laughs> Couple other odds and ends here that I wanted to go over before we talk about the user experience. This was the first consumer laptop that brought Wi-Fi to the masses. Now, it was Wi-Fi capable, but you had to either option it with Wi-Fi or go to an Apple store and buy an airport card because this was serviceable. You could pop the keyboard off of it and actually insert a Wi-Fi card and connect an antenna. They expected and actually trusted you to do that on your own as a user and gave you instructions on how. A couple other things worth mentioning here. I am running macOS 10.4.11, which was the last version of macOS that this actually supported because I wanted to give myself the best chance of getting online that I could, and I knew that I wasn't going to be pulling that off with the original launch software of macOS 9. So that's a thing. And of course, for the I.O. on the side of the machine, this came with a 56K modem, which was living large for that day, a 10 to 100 Ethernet port. That was actually pretty awesome. And because Wi-Fi wasn't standard back then, it was actually pretty common to get online by plugging in directly. Below that, we actually have finally a familiar port, USB, but it's 1.1 and it's about as slow as you'd expect. And I got to experience that while writing this script and trying to move it around. Now below that USB port, we do have a Firewire 400 port, which was first introduced on this model of the iBook. But if you look at prototypes of the iBook, like the one Crazy Ken had on his channel, they were experimenting with putting Firewire on there. And I guess it just took him an extra year to do it. And the last port on this side of the machine is kind of interesting because it's an audio jack. I can plug in a pair of headphones and listen to music or watch movies. 
but it also doubles as video output, which I've seen on some TVs like LGs, where if you want to hook up an old composite signal, you can plug it in and it's this little adapter, but I actually didn't know that they integrated those into Macs. Funnily enough, the DVD-ROM option was the only option on the SE models, but on previous models, you could get a CD-ROM or option it up to a DVD-ROM. But if you get the DVD-ROM, you immediately get the upgrade to CD rewrite capability as well, because that's real fancy. All right, enough about the specs. What is this actually like to use in 2022? Well, there's actually a few things about this laptop that stood out to me as things that I actually kind of wish carried on to newer laptops even today. First and foremost, and I know I'm gonna spark some right to repair conversations with this one, the user upgradeability and user replaceability of several different components, including the battery, which is under a little hatch that you can pop open with a coin, and the Wi-Fi and RAM sticks, which you can take out simply by pulling two tabs on the keyboard and taking the keyboard off. The other thing that I actually love about this laptop and is one of my favorite things about Apple's design language from that era is the fact that the back hinge has an integrated handle. It's such a small thing, but they thought it out so well because if you have a handle, you'll be inclined to carry the laptop around without a case. But if you don't have a case, what happens if you bump it against something? Well, number one, the screen is so small, you have a massive bezel, so it really wouldn't matter because the screen is so far away from the edges, it doesn't, well, it doesn't matter. But the other thing they thought out really well is the fact that you don't want the outside of the laptop to get scratched, even if the internal components are protected. So they coated the most likely areas to get hit with rubber, which is awesome. And it allows for a really nice grip. So you can do that one finger hinge lift that every Mac has had since this, I think since this model actually. And actually speaking of the hinge, the closing mechanism is built into the hinge, similar to how the newer Macs and a lot of newer laptops do it. So this allowed you to close the laptop and keep it closed without needing a latch like a lot of other laptops did in later generations of Macs and how a lot of laptops when this came out were still holding themselves shut. And overall, I think the design itself is just really interesting. It's very of its time, but it's also one of those designs that's just fun. And you kind of look at it with a modern perspective and say, why don't laptops look like this anymore? That would be so cool to pack modern hardware into a laptop that looks like this. But obviously as things have moved on, people want a more simple industrial design, but I don't know. I kind of like my devices to look kind of fun. Now, when it comes to the challenges, we're gonna do the easiest challenge first and then move our way down to the hardest challenge or what I thought would be the hardest challenge. So challenge number one was to write this script on this iBook, which I did. And I did it courtesy of Pages, which is free now and sort of a slap in the face to Microsoft Office because while Windows is charging for it, Apple includes it for free and it's quite frankly just as capable. However, back in the day, the iWork suite was just as capable as Office, if not a little more, depending on what you were using, but they also charged just as much for it. Fortunately, it's not that expensive anymore, and in a lot of cases, you can just find it for free, which is what I did, and threw it on this iBook. Now, it did take quite a while to open because hard drive, and old hard drive at that, and 576 megabytes of RAM, and 466 megahertz processor. So, I was sitting around for a little bit waiting for it to open, and waiting for it to start up a new document. However, once it was open, I really didn't notice any difference between typing a document on this and typing a document on, say, my iPad. And actually, the iPad has a similar screen size, so it was actually right at home for me. Though, while the iPad does have a similar screen size, the resolution is much higher. I mentioned the display earlier, saying it was 800 by 600, and yeah, it was more of a challenge than I anticipated because macOS does its best to sort of make do with this lower resolution. However, there are just some things that don't work at 800 by 600, like the fact that when you make text small enough, the punctuations basically vanish in pages. But at the end of the day, I was able to type this entire script on the iBook. And the only challenge I came across while typing this was not in the typing process or really even the saving process, it was in the transfer of the iBook over to a newer Mac. Yeah, so when I plugged in a USB drive that I thought was formatted correctly, it didn't even show up in the iBook. So I had to format it to something super generic and then plug it into the iBook and then let the iBook actually format it again to something it can recognize. And then I transferred the files over. And moving a document file to a flash drive over USB 1.1 goes about as fast as copying 
let's say an entire album of music to USB 3.1. It's quick, but compared to modern standards, it is horribly slow. If I complained in my 2008 MacBook video about how slow USB 2.0 is, just crank that up to 11 with this USB 1.1 port. Now, the next challenge was actually a lot harder than I had anticipated, which was getting onto a wireless network, because keep in mind, this is wireless capable, and then browsing the web. And I prepped everything as best I could. I moved a program onto this called 10.4 Fox, which is a fully power PC configured web browser and figured that would do the trick. The challenge I actually ran into first was not the web browser. It was getting it onto a wireless network. So when I went to just connect this to my Wi-Fi network, which I had done with many of my other Macs many times, it wouldn't do it. It straight up refused to connect and I couldn't figure out for the life of me why. And it dawned on me that there are one of two things and I'm not sure which that could be causing it to not connect to my newer router. The first one is that the router I have is 802.11ax, the newest standard, and potentially the router doesn't recognize 802.11b anymore. Even though it says it does, it may just not play nice with it. The other thing that could be happening is that the encryption type for the password I use, which is WPA2, could be an issue. This iBook possibly doesn't know how to use that form of encryption. But either way, I wasn't actually able to get it online with my new Wi-Fi system. So that was a big challenge. The solution that I actually had to resolve this was to dust off one of my old airport routers and create a wireless network with it tethered off of my Wi-Fi router currently in use. And lo and behold, it worked. And I was able to actually connect to a Wi-Fi network and load up a website. And of course, the first thing I did was go to Apple's website to see if it would load those newer high-res images. And while it took a very long time, it did pull it off and I was very impressed. But after that, I took a little bit of a blast to the past and went onto the Internet Archive website and loaded up Apple's website from this era and was able to browse the specs page of this specific iBook. It was surreal and something I really enjoyed doing more than I think most people would. So yes, you can browse the web on one of these devices. However, is it really worth it? It is one of the most painfully slow and terribly unoptimized experiences you could ever do. And honestly, with the new formats of web pages expecting larger screens, even on phones, the format of the website is broken. And I realized after, uh, after writing this script that the website that it pulled up for apple.com was technically the mobile version. I guess that was just the least power demanding one that it could pull up for this device. And the last challenge, this is the one that I thought would be the most difficult to do because I knew deep, deep in the back of my head that there was no way on earth I would be able to stream video on this thing, period. And I was right. The video just couldn't load up on any streaming site. Crunchyroll, Netflix, YouTube, you name it, wouldn't do it. And I anticipated that. I knew that the power and video encoding required for that kind of streaming setup would not work. And I was ready to give up just because it wasn't possible. You could not watch video on this. But then I had a thought. I figured my own rules didn't say how I had to watch a video. They just said I had to watch a video. And then I remembered that this has a DVD-ROM drive in it. So armed with that knowledge, I went and grabbed a copy of Psychopass, threw the DVD into the DVD drive, and it loaded up like it was nothing and played through all the episodes I wanted to watch with no issues. However, 800 by 600 on a TFT panel from the year 2000 isn't the best viewing experience. In fact, if you're not looking at it straight on, all the colors wash away. So you can do it. I pulled it off. I was very proud that I was able to bend my own rules in order to make it work and make it happen, but no. And funnily enough, I actually ended up plugging in headphones to listen to it. And only after plugging in headphones did I realize the jack is 16-bit for audio. So certain mixes in Psychopaths just mushed together because of how low the output signal quality was. And you're not playing the speakers on this because the speaker, singular, sounds so bad. Like, I thought that the Mac Mini speaker was bad, but no, this is on a whole other level. Like, this speaker literally exists to make chimes, not to play music or any sort of audio aside from that. <laughs> 
So like I said at the beginning of this video, these challenges were done by a professional idiot and I don't recommend you try these at home. If you have one of these computers, use it as a really cool piece of Apple history in a collection like I do. Don't anticipate on using it as a super cheap daily driver and they're not even that cheap anymore. An SE model can sell well into the hundreds because of how uncommon these are now. And if you have a Keylime one, which was the online exclusive, oh my God, you're paying new Mac money for one of those. So it's not even a cheap alternative. And to no one's surprise, a 21 year old Mac is not the ticket to getting online and browsing the web at a budget. Like it's just not. Either way, guys, that's been it. Thank you so much for watching this video. I really do enjoy these challenges and I hope you do too. This was a bit more extreme. I think for the next one, I'm gonna try these exact same challenges, but on a 2003 Power Mac G5 desktop, because I think that might have a better chance of actually working. But either way, if you guys liked the video, make sure to like it. If you didn't, you can go ahead and dislike, but let me know what you didn't like so I can improve for later. Subscribe, the whole nine yards. And apart from that, I'll see you all in the next video. Make sure to be there and have a good one.